Well, for more on this story, let's speak to David Hurst, who's the Middle East, who's the editor rather of the Middle East Eye, a website that focuses on Middle East news and analysis. He joins us live from London. Thank you very much, David, for being with us. So, the way the succession went before in Saudi Arabia is that it went from brother to brother. So, just how significant is this uh, recent reshuffle? Are we seeing now the new generation come into power? Absolutely. Uh, what we're seeing is, 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 is a generational shift, a complete, almost complete clear out of all the people that uh, Salman's predecessor uh, uh, Abdullah put in power. I say almost complete because there is still Prince Migrin uh, uh, as a minister in charge of the National Guard. Now there are informed rumours, and I think word is informed, that the National Guard could itself be subsumed once again into the Defence Ministry which, of course, is held by uh, Salman's son, uh, Mohammed. Uh, so Megrin is still there, but, uh, but uh, all the others are out, including Mukrin and including uh, Al Faisal, the, the f uh, foreign minister who, who stayed as the world's longest foreign minister. Right. I think and, it's a complete change. Yeah, and it's also the second time, you mentioned the foreign minister, it's also the second time only in the kingdom's history that they're giving the foreign minister's post to a non-royal. What does this suggest? What does it say? Well, in this particular case, it suggests that uh, Sama wants to keep uh, his contacts with the U.S. administration extremely warm. Um, and the importance of that appointment is, in fact, the former ambassador's contacts with the U.S. administration. He's also, by the way, a liberal. Um, and that's important in the overall makeup of, uh, of the administration in Riyadh. Mm. So foreign policy wise, what changes are we likely to see? A lot of people talk about the timing of the reshuffle, of course, you know, Saudi Arabia flexing its muscles right now in, in neighboring Yemen at the forefront of the intervention there against what is perceived as uh, Iranian involvement in Yemen. Does this reshuffle play into that? It does indeed. I mean, um, there are several things uh, at play here. I mean, the central big drama is the pushback against Iranian-backed <laughs> militias, not only in Yemen, but in Syria and in Iraq. And in Syria, we are seeing it has a marked effect. The new so-called Salman doctrine is having its effect, and we're seeing groups who used to fight each other are now uh, fighting alongside each other, and they are winning territory in Idlib and also on the outskirts of Damascus. So that, that's one effect. And Yemen is a much more complicated case. Um, I think the winners of uh, this reshuffle are Turkey and Qatar, and the losers will be the United Arab Emirates and Egypt. Um, uh, two of the connections uh, of, uh, that, that, that have been pushed out were very closely involved with uh, the relations between um, Riyadh and, and Sisi's Egypt. Uh, Mukrin uh, was the man who um, uh, who, who went to Sharm el Sheikh, mm -hmm. if you remember, um, and um, and he was also uh, uh, the man who saw the uh, Egyptian ambassador when CC protested uh, ab about the leaked reports in which he denigrated his Gulf donors. So he was an important uh, link man. Mm. Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, the the Crown Prince of uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, has a tried to see uh, uh, Salman three times and only succeeded in seeing him once. Uh, in, in power, and he shelters uh, uh, Ahmed Ali uh, uh, Saleh's son, Ahmed, mm. in, um, in, in Abu Dhabi. Right. So, the, so uh, he's on the opposite side, really, of the conflict in Yemen. So very interesting as far as foreign policy-wise. What about internally? Are we going to see any changes? You mentioned the foreign minister being more liberal. Uh, that's the foreign minister, obviously. But, you know, what about internally within the kingdom itself? Are we going to see any changes? Are we going to see it become more liberal? Well, that is the key question. It's certainly all power has now been seized by Salman. He, ha he has an opportunity uh, to shape the kingdom in his fashion and um, it has passed to the second generation. Now, the one, I think, positive thing that Abdullah did was he sent out thousands, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of Saudis for higher education abroad. They've now come back with a youthful leadership. If you're being optimistic, there is a real chance for Saudi Arabia to move towards greater transparency, to move towards a greater distribution of wealth, and to move to make democratic moves. Will that happen? 
I really cannot say. But there's a challenge and an opportunity there because the torch, the power, has passed to a new generation. David Hurst, very interesting to talk to you. Thank you so much for your insight. David Hurst is editor of the Middle East Eye. He was joining us there from London.